coming up on the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. In the ketosis state, like you have these ketones and those are great for producing energy. But when you're using fatty acids for energy, it's not ideal. It's not as efficient for ATP production and it comes at a cost and you have lower NAD, which is a, the NAD to NADH ratio is one of the central regulators of how well we're producing energy in the mitochondria. And so this is my biggest concern when it comes to the a ketogenic diet, especially in a non in a state where it's not necessary, a situation where it's not genetically necessary or something like that, is that because we have to shift into this largely fat burning state, and because that fat oxidation is less efficient than the carb oxidation, it leads to greater reactive oxygen species production, a lower NAD to NADH ratio, which leads to all of the hormetic uh, effects, all of those adaptations. But because of that difference, my that's one of my central concerns with a ketogenic diet is, is that difference. Hello, and welcome to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. I'm Brian Grin, and I'm here to give you actionable tips to get your body back to what it once was 5, 10, even 15 years ago. Each week, I'll give you an in-depth interview with a health expert from around the world to cut through the fluff and get you long-term sustainable results. This week, I interviewed keto researcher and professor, Dr. Don Diagostino, along with health coach and bioenergetic researcher, Jay Feldman, for the second time around. This was a friendly debate in which we discussed all about fats versus carbs as a fuel source, along with autophagy, is fructose to blame for fatty liver disease, does higher omega-3s increase lifespan, problems with oxidized PUFAs, and are carbs beneficial for our physiology? I really enjoyed my interview with Dr. Dom and Jay. This was the second time we've done it, and I think there was great points on both ends of the spectrum. Thanks so much for listening, and enjoy the show. All right, welcome to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. My name is Brian Grin, and I have Dr. Dom Diagostino and Jay Feldman on for part two. Welcome, guys. Thanks for having me. Brian. Hi, Jay. Great to see you guys again. Hey, guys. Yeah, I'm excited. This is part two. If you haven't listened to part one, definitely check that out. That was done a couple months ago. And uh, we're going to touch on all different topics today. And I was just thinking before the conversation started how how these conversations are, I think, are healthy um, in these discussions around nutrition and um, brain health and things that we're going to get into today. So um, I was definitely looking forward to doing this again. And, and I know we were uh, cut short a little bit last time. So uh, but we're going to just jump right in. And um, I guess <clears throat> we could start in many different places, maybe. Um, why don't we just touch a little bit on some of the things that we talked about last time, um, regarding, and Don, maybe you'll touch on like the ketogenic diet. I know we talked about different applications of, you know, brain health. What are you, what are you working on now? And, and maybe, uh, I know you want to touch on some things regarding that. So, yeah, uh, well, we have a study, uh, that we haven't published yet in as far as a peer reviewed publication, but we've presented it at about a half dozen conferences. And that's uh, taking people who are non-diabetic, non-obese, uh, and we're using continuous glucose monitoring. Uh, in this case, the Abbott Libre device with the levels uh, uh, software application. And we are looking at glycemic variability as a uh, monitoring glycemic variability as a means to alter behavior around eating and creating metabolic awareness uh, in regards to food selection and, and the amount of food. Uh, but in, in our case, we're actually using a low carb diet, a ketogenic diet. So we have a massive data set from that. You get, we have a group wearing CGMs and a group wearing, not wearing CGMs. And the bottom line is that there may be some, uh, uh, benefit to wearing a CGM in, in regard to people like it other, you know, above pricking their finger, uh, that group seems to have a better reduction in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Interestingly, we saw like 60 to 70% of the people who are like, you know, normal people had non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or hepatic steatosis, the precursor to that. Uh, and then actually some of the psychological measures, we use the GAD7 test, PHQ9, we look at sleep, there's a wellness score, mood, and things like that. They trended better in people that had uh, continuous glucose monitor. Uh, but you know, but the main cardiometabolic biomarkers really weren't much different. Uh, but but I think people do like 
the idea they game they gamify a CGM device and uh, all the benefits seem to happen in the first six weeks and then it kind of levels off and a lot of people just stop even looking at opening up the app to look at their the continuous glucose monitor and you know I, I'm wearing one now I got uh, Dexcom on and uh, I, I've I've wore a Dexcom on one side and, and the Abbott on the other and then I compare the two. Oh, interesting. And, and <laughs> uh, so I've done that. And then, you know, working with different companies that are developing continuous ketone monitor. I'm I'm excited about using these things for metabolic management of epilepsy and neurometabolic disorders. So, so there's that on the clinical front. We're doing a lot on the space research front. Uh, I don't want to go down that path because that's mm -hmm. like a whole nother podcast. But, uh, but we're looking at ketones as epigenetic regulators. So my student, my PhD student, this did her CQE and passed, and we're looking at uh, the metabolic control of epigenetic regulation. Uh, so ketones impacting something called beta hydroxybutyrylation. So beta hydroxybutyrate can interact directly with a histone and cause modifications and then changing in gene expression. We're specifically looking at disorders like Kabuki syndrome and uh, pump, pump syndrome, which is glycogen synthase disorder type two, like some of the things that your listeners may not have heard about, but in, in many cases, the ketogenic diet is very therapeutic for uh, inborn errors in metabolism and, and also in cases of genetic diseases. So there could be a persistent molecular pathology. Uh, you're not changing the, the disease state, but you are symptomatically managing the disease, the, the symptoms associated with a genetic disorder. So even in the presence of a persistent molecular pathology, a ketogenic diet can be used to manage that. Or in the case, we're actually using ketone supplementation in the form of various ketogenic agents. And that, that's a PhD dissertation. Uh, we're looking at autophagy. We're uh, using LC, so you can't measure, a lot of people talk about autophagy, it becomes a big discussion. And a lot of people talk about many different things, but they don't actually measure it. And so measuring these things is quite tricky. Uh, it's very nuanced. Uh, you have to measure the autophagosome. So we do LC3 and P62 are some of the, the autophagosome markers that you measure. Uh, so hey, we are looking Tom, at- Maybe yeah. explain to people listening, um, maybe what autophagy is, uh, you know, just give them a high level idea what that is. Cause I know that's come into yeah. light a lot with, with low carb and fasting and things like that. Yeah, it gets talked about a lot, uh, you know, and, and even though we're doing research on it, there's so many things that there's, that we don't understand, but in the the very basic sense, autophagy is self eating, and it's kind of you know, in simplistic terms, the housekeeping uh, right. pathway associated. It's happening all the time. It's happening on a high carb diet. <laughs> it's happening on a low carb diet. It, it 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 does increase the autophagic flux. So you measure something called autophagic flux when you're measuring autophagy and it's the, the ratios of certain things uh, in the context of an energy deficit. So when you have AMPK uh, activated and, and mTOR is low, insulin is low and things like that, the flux of autophagy will be higher and just because you're in more catabolic state. And uh, the idea for certain disorders that we're looking at, including glycogen synthase disorder type two, which there is a decrease in autophagy, uh, we're trying to see if we can enhance autophagic flux to decrease uh, glycogen accumulation and, and uh, lysosomal activation. We want to do that without necessarily creating a sustained energy deficit, which is not feasible. You know, you, you can't fast, you can't do calorie restriction indefinitely. So we're, uh, we're developing protocols that could enhance autophagic flux by suppressing the hormone insulin, maybe actually increasing glucagon a little bit uh, and, and various catabolic pathways for certain disorders. Um, and yes, and, so, and, and sorry to interrupt you, an exercise also. Um, yeah, that's a big one. It. Yeah. Okay. Probably more than anything else, actually, uh, uh, exercise, especially in the context of an energy deficit, will increase it. But even 
you know, in a, in a fed individual that does vigorous exercise, you're kicking on autophagy. And I think there are many benefits uh, to that. Uh, but autophagy is not really good or bad. It's just part of a, a, a normal process. Uh, in certain disease states, increasing autophagic flux can enhance the degradation or can, can enhance certain processes in the body and make the immune system more vigilant, for example, uh, in being able to recognize cancer cells. So it can increase uh, anti-cancer like immunity. So there's people doing research on that um, and can augment certain aspects of our physiology that can be beneficial. Uh, but, you know, we're looking at it mostly from a disease state. And I, and I guess for the normal healthy person, you know, fasting can, can activate autophagy and may, uh, you know, and the people that I communicate with, they talk to me and they have a lot of questions about autophagy. And for example, they may have a uh, an inflammatory episode, or they're trying to manage some kind of chronic autoimmune disorder, and uh, they're talking about, hey, how how can I maximize autophagy? And, and mm. I, I don't really know, <laughs> you know. Uh, I, I I do have, I can speculate though. I think, uh, and what we like to measure is the glucose ketone index. If you lower glucose and elevate ketones, sort of in a one to one ratio, for example, bring glucose down from five to three millimolar and elevate ketones to three millimolar. That's a glucose ketone index of one. And that typically correlates with an insulin that's very low around two to three. And in that particular physiological state would be sort of analogous to what we see in animal models with increasing autophagic flux. So uh, now this is speculation if we're talking, and I'm a basic science animal researcher, you know, and, and cells and, and, and we do, we do human research too, but 80% of what I do is animal research. So if I was to extrapolate kind of what we see in animals, uh, if you can achieve a glucose ketone index of one, I would speculate, and I don't know if anyone's done this in humans, that you would be activating and triggering perhaps even maximum autophagy. So, you know, periodically I will put myself into a state of fasting where I achieve a glucose ketone index of one. Uh, but once I do that and maintain that for 24 hours, I quickly get back to eating again because if I do that for a prolonged period of time, it tanks my hormones. Uh, like testosterone goes down. I think it, it, you know, it's starting to reduce my metabolism. And if you fast for a week, it takes, it takes a week or two to recover from that. So, and we can get into this and it's not really talked about that much. And I think you guys, uh, I think this is a good platform for, for discussing the pros and cons of, of doing some of the stuff I did, you know, years ago that I don't do now. I don't do intermittent fasting now. I mean, right now I'm fasted, I guess, because I didn't didn't have time to eat this morning. Mm -hmm. But uh, but generally speaking, if I fast, you know, it might be once a week, maybe twice a week if I have like a heavy morning lecture. But I, I don't think it's like the default. I don't think keto should be the default diet, and I don't think intermittent fasting should be uh, done every day uh, for most people. Yeah, Dom, and just on that point, like, uh, I'm, I, I was the same way. I think this, the, the way I did things years ago are a little bit different now. We've all changed and evolved and learned. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I hear you. I mean, I think, like you said, these are tools. And I, I do think that, like, um, fasting is a tool. I think it's something that if you've never done it before, I think it's worth, like, at least, like, easing your way into it and, and just, like, exploring it because it does give you – what I've learned is for my, my own good, because I don't do it as much now, like you said, Dom, is it just when you know you need to do it or like, let's say you're traveling and there's just crappy food and you're like, OK, I don't yeah. I, I'm good. Like, I don't need to rely on anything. I think there's that sort of like confidence and that sort of um, just gives you that flexibility when you when you maybe aren't in a situation where you're going to eat something that's actually halfway decent. And it works better as a tool. It works better if you're not doing it all the time, right? If you do it all the time, then your body adapts to this intermittent fast. And if you go to eating, you know, now I eat like three meals a day, maybe sometimes four, um, then 
you'll likely overeat. You may overeat when you do that. So uh, I feel that intermittent fasting works best if you don't do it all the time. Same with keto. I mean, I'm pretty low carb and I will, uh, on many days, I'm in a state of ketosis. I, I, I mostly just do a, a low, very low carb ketogenic diet uh, because I'm a researcher and I'm constantly experimenting. Although I've been eating more carbs, like I, I could see in my, my face is more full because uh, I, I, I eat a, quite a bit of fruit and probably about a cup of blueberries every day. Uh, then we have fruit on our property. We have a farm. So um, I'm trying to think. Oh, I, need, I, have, I, need, I need a farm. <laughs> I have dark chocolate. Every day I have dark chocolate and I have probably about 50 grams of fruit, uh, carbs worth of fruit per day uh, on average. But uh, And I wake up, I'm not in ketosis, but by middle of the day, to the, the latter half of the day, uh, my ketones are about one millimolar. That seems to work good for me. You know, if I was to wanting to gain weight, a uh, significant amount of weight or muscle, or if I was an athlete, I'm kind of a sedentary guy, although I like to lift weights, but uh, I would titrate carbs back in for sure. Have you found, uh, Dom, just uh, on that point, uh, a difference in, in your body composition or your weight since you've added in some more carbs or oh, uh, had three, four meals a day as opposed to not? Yeah. Yeah, I, I actually this weekend I went through all like my medical records because I'm scanning all my blood work back to 1992. Uh, I started getting blood work in 1992 because uh, I went on a drug for acne. It was called Accutane. Oh yeah, and and you have to like monitor your liver enzymes. And I noticed my liver enzymes were high. Not they were in range, but they were always high when I was eating very high protein. Uh, and now my liver enzymes are like in the teens or twenties, but they were typically in the thirties and forties all through my twenties when I was just like eating like 400 grams of protein a day, 500 grams, you know, but my blood work that my blood pressure, glucose, and many things have remained stable. So, uh, I've actually, I'm scanning all this, I'm graphing it cause I, I'm, I'm approaching 50 and I want to get a handle of all the, the major, you know, body weight, body composition. When I was eating carbs, I was holding a lot of, a lot more muscle for sure. Um, and I think it, I think having a little bit of insulin, you know, just through some carb consumption definitely made me bigger and stronger. My hormones are not what they used to be. Uh, you know, and, and whether that's because of keto or not, I'm not sure. So adding a little bit of carbs back in, I have been monitoring my, uh, my testosterone and other hormones, my, my, uh, my insulin and my glucagon are well within normal range. So I know we talked about that previously before, but my testosterone tends to fluctuate like between around 400 to like, and, and I look back at my blood work when I was in my twenties and even thirties, and I was like six, 700, a couple times, 800, you know, so I'm almost half that. Uh, and I don't, I think that's more of an age thing. I don't think it's a keto thing. Uh, the highest I've been on like being strictly keto was 576, I think. And I've never been over that on keto. Whereas prior to keto, I consistently was like in the six or 700. So it, it's pop, but I think it's more of the, the decrease in some of my hormones is associated with, uh, a decrease in body weight and a decrease in total uh, calorie consumption over time because I lost body weight. Uh, but I'm still like, I mean, technically I'm like overweight. So uh, when but, you uh, say technically you're overweight, are you saying just based on like a BMI or something? Yeah. Or, you don't look is, overweight to me. No, my BMI okay. is like 28 or 20. Yeah, you know, I had yeah. to fast <laughs> to get, when I got life insurance, I fasted. Uh, I think the lowest I got was like 205 or almost got down to 200 when I had to do like my life insurance. Cause I pay a higher premium because I'm, I'm overweight, but I, I'm 217.5 right now. Uh, and, and I'd like to kind of maintain that, but I, you know, 20 years ago, it was like 230, 245, even, uh, just eating a lot of weight. You know, I was training a lot, uh, training with like back with Lane Norton back in 2007, eight, nine. Uh, I think that's when I achieved some of my highest body weight, but I was eating a ton of food. And I do not think that is, that is not optimal for longevity. Uh, I had my highest blood pressure, you know, totally correlates with my body weight. So bring my body weight down. Uh, 
The only thing that looks scary to my doctor and she's urging me to get on a statin is my LDL. My LDL and ApoBRI. So that's the main thing that I'm trying to experiment with now to manage. And maybe we could get into a talk, a little bit of discussion about that. But uh, Okay. Well, Jay, maybe we should bring you in here. Yeah, sorry, I've been talking. That's <laughs> okay. There is a third person. No. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm here, I'm here. <laughs> so, uh, Jay, maybe what have you been up to since the last time we talked? Are you writing any more blog posts? You got. I know you did a most recent podcast episode on your podcast, which is the um, Energy Balance podcast. Um, anything new come to mind that's uh, since the last time we talked? Not too much. I do want to mention. So last time we had the earthquake, now we have some construction going on. I'm in a new place in Mexico, right on the other wall. And this morning they're drilling. So oh, it's okay. been pretty loud over here. I'm going to try to stay muted when I'm not talking. And hopefully they, it just works out well where when I'm talking, they're quiet. Oh, okay. um, but if, if they do start, it'll just be a second or two. Really sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. But yeah. I would say, you know, since we last talked, not, to, you know, haven't been experimenting with anything particularly different uh, or exploring any any particularly new topics um yeah not Do too much to dr share. dr pete passed away yeah Correct. yeah it's very yeah. sad yeah. yeah heartbreaking news yeah um and so with with that why don't we i mean there's a lot of great topics Dom, that we already touched on a little bit but um let's touch on like Glucose oxidation versus fat oxidation. We'll start with that and dive in there. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because I mean, we talked about it last time, like what's the, is there a, is there a best way to go about that? Um, if it, and is it good to come, come in and out and be somewhat flexible from that standpoint? Um, so I don't know, Jay, maybe you want to touch on, on your, I know you were obviously more on on the glucose, on like becoming an efficient glucose oxidator. And you're, you, well, I'll let you explain why that is as opposed to just eliminating that or at least eliminating a lot of things that, that would, you know, obviously carbs that would have you become maybe a better at it. So I'll let you get into that. Yeah. So, so there's a couple of things that I would, that, that come to mind. So one thing I know we talked a lot about last time is that one of the main features of any degenerative state tends to be issues metabolically, issues with mitochondrial function, and with that normally issues with glucose oxidation. And that's a lot of the situations that a ketogenic diet or supplemental ketones benefits. And I think we talked about this as well, where I have less of an issue with, well, so, okay. So first thing is my preference is always to say, let's fix that metabolic dysfunction. If in the meantime, we maybe need to drop carbs down to feel better or to, you know, create some outcome, then I think that's fine. And again, this is talking about somebody who doesn't have a genetic disorder or something like that. And, but so my focus would be to say, let's fix that ability to oxidize the glucose. And the reason why I wouldn't say, let's just go to a ketogenic diet long-term, which I'm not saying that Dom is saying, in fact, you're kind of suggesting the opposite last time. And, you know, we were talking earlier today, uh, the reason for that is not because of the ketones themselves, as I was saying, I don't have as much of a concern with the ketones, but rather that in order to get into that ketogenic state, uh, A, we end up really having to rely entirely on fat other than the ketones we produce. And I think there's a cost to that reliance on fat oxidation. And then the other piece too is the the fact that we, you know, as we discussed, there is a stress uh, involved or it is stressful to get into a ketogenic state. And I think that there's a potential cost to that as well. And so that's something we can dig back into too, and the, the hormonal regulation there. But as far as the glucose versus fat burning, because I think that that's really the central point here. Also, is the drilling really bad? Or oh, you you're fine. Me? You're fine. Okay. It's real light. Right. Yeah. That's good. That's good. So I know I kind of phrased it this way, and we had both agreed that a ketogenic diet is, or a ketogenic state is something that happens when we're in a starvation state, a famine state, a situation where we're not eating at all, where we're fasting. And as such, there are certain like I, I think our bodies are tuned to respond to that state in a particular way, which involves those hormonal shifts. It's supposed to be stressful and it's supposed to involve turning down our metabolic rate so that we can survive without food for longer. And there are signals on the hormonal side that, that tend to signal that, but also in terms of the bioenergetics, in terms of what's actually going on in the mitochondria, 
uh, and outside the mitochondria between oxidizing glucose and carbohydrate uh, and fat. And so I know we talked, I think very briefly, Dom, you had mentioned Dr. Richard Veach last time. And I know in one of his, his later papers in 2014, he had discussed this and he had said basically that he is more of a fan of using supplemental ketones as opposed to the ketogenic diet. And yeah. he was saying that that's because of these negative effects of fat oxidation, of fat burning, which has to happen when we're on a ketogenic diet. Um, and I have a, a real quick quote that I wanted to share, if you guys don't mind, that he had, this is from his paper in 2014, titled Ketone Ester Effects on Metabolism and Transcription. And he says, ketosis induced by starvation or feeding a ketogenic diet has widespread and often co contradictory effects due to the simultaneous elevation of both ketone bodies and free fatty acids. The elevation of ketone bodies increases the energy of ATP hydrolysis by reducing the mitochondrial NAD couple and oxidizing the coenzyme Q couple, thus increasing the redox span between site one and site two. In contrast, metabolism of fatty acids leads to a reduction of both mitochondrial NAD and mitochondrial coenzyme Q, causing a decrease in the delta G of ATP hydrolysis. And to kind of, for a listener who's like, that doesn't mean a lot to, what he's basically <laughs> saying is that in the ketosis state, like you have these ketones and those are great for producing energy, but when you're using fatty acids for energy, it's not ideal. It's not as efficient for ATP production and it comes at a cost and you have lower NAD, which is a, the NAD to NADH ratio is one of the central regulators of how well we're producing energy in the mitochondria. And so this is my biggest concern when it comes to the a ketogenic diet, especially in a non in a state where it's not necessary, a situation where it's not genetically necessary or something like that, is that because we have to shift into this largely fat burning state, and because that fat oxidation is less efficient than the carb oxidation, it leads to greater reactive oxygen species production, a lower NAD to NADH ratio, which leads to all of the hormetic uh, effects, all of those adaptations. But because of that difference, my that's one of my central concerns with a ketogenic diet is, is that difference. And I'm happy to kind of dig into that for listeners if we want to talk in more detail about what exactly happens when we burn glucose versus fatty acids. It's mostly just biochemistry, which might not be that valuable to a listener. But um, yeah, I, I'm so I'm curious to know what you think about that, Tom. Yeah. Uh, so Dr. Veach, I connected with him uh, in maybe 2008. And we had many conversations on the phone, many emails. I uh, actually went to Dr. Veach's lab at the NIH and he showed me, he walked me through the whole process of making ketone ester. And uh, Todd King was the chemist there at the time. I consumed ketone ester. Uh, and we did talk, he, the, the papers that he forwarded me about uh, the, the dangers of a ketogenic diet uh, and, and high fat oxidation, he, he referenced and sent me a paper that was done at Johns Hopkins, a clinical trial showing elevated triglycerides in kids. So uh, this particular study was, I think it was using keto cow, which is mostly hydrogenated soybean oil. And they, you know, so that the, the papers he was sending me were ketogenic diets that were clinical. And they also had a fatty acid composition that was literally scary. Uh, and, but we had a lot, he, he convinced me. So my initial uh, proposal to the Office of Navy Research, which is part of the Department of Defense, he was funded by DARPA at the time to develop ketones for warfighter performance. But uh, the, the problems with the ketogenic diet, the clinical ketogenic diet, I thought were, were real. And um, uh, in the context of what I was studying it for, which would be for warfighter resilience against oxygen toxicity, high levels of oxygen. Uh, at the time, I was studying polyunsaturated fatty acids and showing that uh, a high PUFA content in the membrane was uh, elevating malondialdehyde with a T-bars test. And I also used hyperbaric atomic force microscopy to show that the membrane viscoelasticity, fluidity, and membrane oxidation was increasing with high uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids, which uh, I think you guys touched on a little bit, maybe. So that was my interest, it, you know, and, and the, there was a potential danger of high fat diet there. Long story short, the, the Navy did not like the idea of a high fat diet. So I changed my proposal and switched out the ketogenic diet with exogenous ketones, a ketone ester. Uh, the first ketone ester that we tested was 1,3-butanediol beta-hydroxybutyrate monoester. And it did not have any anti-seizure effects. 
So I started to kind of lose enthusiasm because Dr. Veach was very convincing in that, uh, you know, the delta G of ATP hydrolysis would be, you know, enhanced with ketones and things like that. And I really thought it was going to change brain energy metabolism in a way that would confer resilience against an oxidative challenge. In our case, it was five atmospheres of, of oxygen, uh, which increases brain brain oxygenation, the PO2 in the brain increases by like 2000% when you're breathing uh, high pressure oxygen, right? Hemoglobin saturated, but the oxygen is actually dissolved into the plasma and that plasma spike up, you know, uh, causes redox stress and then the seizure, that, that's what we were studying. Uh, so long story short, I connected with another investigator, maybe even like a, a a colleague, but maybe a, a, a competing <laughs> biochemist with Dr. Beach. Uh, his name was Henri Brunegrabber, and he uh, he managed the NIH-sponsored metabolomics core at Case Western. And he gave, gave me a, a recipe to synthesize uh, uh, a different ketone ester that was 1,3-butane-dial acetoacetate uh, diester. And I... I, I couldn't find anybody in academia to, to make it for me. So uh, I end, actually ended up connecting with Patrick Arnold, who created a lot of performance enhancing compounds for different applications. He synthesized it for me. And using this ketone ester, elevating acetoacetate and beta hydroxybutyrate in a way that's redox balanced. When you deliver a big bolus of beta hydroxybutyrate, it shifts the redox at the level of the cell in a way to become more reduced. And it also ch shifts the, the redox state in the liver. But when you deliver it in a redox balanced preparation, which would be beta hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate in balance ratios, then this did a number of different things. In our case, the most important thing is that it had a profound effect, not changing diet at all, just simply giving a ketone ester uh, increased the resilience to seizures by 600%, which means that an animal typically seizes in like five to 10 minutes under these extreme environmental conditions. Most of our animals would go to like an hour. Uh, so that's elevating beta hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate. And, uh, it, but the same thing can happen if you fast the animal. Uh, 24, 24 hours of fasting in a rat is like, you know, three or three days of fasting, three to five days of fasting for a human that would dramatically increase resilience, uh, reduce. But if you fasted the animal 36 hours, then it was also remarkable about a 300% increase in, uh, the latency to seizure, but a single dose of this particular ketone ester prolonged the latency to seizure up to almost 600%. So that actually convinced me that independent of a ketogenic diet, independent of shifting macronutrients, you could deliver ketones with an oral gavage and, and it's totally shifting metabolic physiology. Uh, and it's actually increasing fat oxidation too, even at the level of the muscle. He, he did some studies showing that. But for some reason, beta hydroxybutyrate alone did not have an anti-seizure effect. So I started developing and testing different exogenous ketone formulations, which we got a bunch of patents on things like that. But it gave me an appreciation of ketones as an alternative energy substrate, in particular for brain metabolism. And that set me off in 2009, I guess we're talking now. It, that actually set the stage for my career to, to, study, uh, to study different bioenergetic molecules and uh, with a de-emphasis on the ketogenic diet. But then we came back to the ketogenic diet when we were studying cancer and, and different cancer models are very responsive. And then we started looking at blood glucose lowering. We started looking at uh, inflammatory pathways. Uh, we have models where we give LPS 
a lipopolysaccharide. If you inject it in animals, you know, in mice, you can essentially kill them all. But if they're in a state of, of ketosis with supplemental ketones, you can rescue the animal. So, uh, so, so we did a lot of work outside of the world of epilepsy, which is kind of like my bread and butter, so to speak. Um, everything from Alzheimer's disease to ALS to, you know, and, and many different model systems ketosis is, is therapeutic. And I believe it's therapeutic because it's enhancing the bioenergetic pathways. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's restoring bioenergetic pathways in the context of a deficiency. And I think that's important. It doesn't mean just because you get favorable therapeutic effects in a particular animal model and even in humans under certain uh, disease states does not mean that people should be jumping on a ketogenic diet and especially doing that in a prolonged way. And I don't even follow a ketogenic diet anymore, but I do stay very low carb. Uh, but yeah, so that was my, my, I have many Dr. Veach stories, <laughs> uh, but that, that's kind of what he, he actually inspired me to go down this path. So I have to, and we had different views. He did believe that high fat diets were dangerous and I did not hold that view completely. I, I also felt not to like in a disparaging way, but, but promoting high fat diets as being something that's potentially dangerous is also a way to promote your exogenous ketone, right? <laughs> So I, I feel that there was some bias against high fat diets to promote the, to promote the use of ketogenic agents in place of a ketogenic diet. But it always confused me because the only clinical application of a ketogenic diet was for seizures. And I was like, well, if you're developing these ketogenic agents, why would you not just studying them in seizure models, which... I was the one that stepped in and started doing this. And we did, you know, the phenylene tetrazole model, model. We have the, the, we have an absence of epilepsy model. We have many different models of seizures. Uh, the ketogenic diets work, but exogenous ketones also work. Certain ones work and certain ones don't. And, and I think we don't fully understand why certain ones don't. Uh, but we do know that in the case of you get to get maximum anti-seizure effect, you have to have a ratio of beta-hydroxybutyrate to acetoacetate. It's not just spiking up beta-hydroxybutyrate. And, and I think that's important in it for people wanting to just enhance their brain energy metabolism for cognition, for longevity and things like that. And we, we have not done the mechanistic work to understand why that's the case. Uh, so it's like a top-down approach. Like we see this observation, but we don't fully understand why. The, so, the, so but sorry, it comes down to redox biochemistry. Sorry to interrupt, Dom. I just oh, um, so Jay. I guess um, I guess the point for Dom is is that you know there's a this clinical application for using the keto diet, obviously, um, which you've been studying for a long time. Uh, but let's perhaps try to talk about like just for the general population. Um, do we think it plays a role? Um, and Jay, I know you're. What do you think at any time, like we talked about, if an individual is like not insulin sensitive and, you know, they have these underlying issues, um, bringing carb. And when we talk about bringing carbs down, there's, that's a broad term, right? Like what type of carbs, you know, are we talking mainly grains and processed, um, carbs? Cause that's a lot different than, than having whole food carbs, perhaps, you know, obviously, like we talked about fruit and things like that. And we can get into fruit because I, it's interesting. I just, Dr. Ken Berry, and I think Jay, I sent you, um, he did a recent post. He did an inter he did a podcast with Dr. Saladino regarding uh, fructose and honey. And, and he was just talking about how fructose can cause this guy, perhaps could cause gly glycation. Um, but that's a whole nother uh, sort of topic. I don't know, Jay, if you want to jump in here. Um, did you, did you see the video I sent you that he did? Yeah, I did. I okay. saw, I saw that you sent it to me yesterday. I didn't watch the video. I okay. looked very briefly at the references and again, so this is premature cause I haven't looked through all the references, but the only one that it looks like had anything to do with increasing ages in an actual, uh, applicable sense where it wasn't just, um, mechanistic, but rather saying like we gave 
in this case, it was rats, fructose and increased ages was the way it was phrased. The only study that he cited that was doing that looked at fructose sweetened beverages versus glucose sweetened beverages versus, uh, I don't remember if it was sucrose or just free glucose plus free fructose sweetened beverages in addition to a regular diet. And the glucose sweetened one and the glucose fructose one or the sucrose, whichever one it was, there was no negative effect. It was only in the fructose only sweetened beverage uh, group, which I, I've talked about ad nauseum, ad nauseum that uh, that's not relevant to any situation when we would be getting fructose. Any place in nature where we're getting fructose, it tends to be at close to a one-to-one -one ratio of fructose to glucose. Uh, there's some variation, but we're always getting some glucose there. And when we get fructose without glucose, we don't absorb it in the intestines. It requires, we need to have some glucose coming in to get some good fructose absorption uh, is kind of part one. And so in a lot of the animal models where they look at fatty liver disease and they look at fructose, what's happening is they're giving pure fructose. The fructose doesn't get absorbed. It feeds bacteria. They produce that lipopolysaccharide that Dom was talking about using earlier to, which can kill uh, an organism. And that then causes the fatty liver disease. And if they add something like antibiotics to that situation to prevent the lipopolysaccharide production, that effect goes away, even with the pure fructose. And so this is something we see with alcohol as well, uh, which again, kind of a, another tangent here, but yeah, I think to, to put it as simply as like fructose causes fatty liver disease or fructose increases ages when that's the context is just not, not representative of the reality. Um, I would love to come back. I, I know, Dom, you want to jump in, so I'll let you jump in, but I did well, want to come back. I have, to a, I have a quick fructose just observation because I've literally been scanning like all my blood work for 30 years and uh, and also looking at uh, my, my diet journals and also my, uh, my food, what I was buying. <laughs> Uh, in like 2007, I would, I would have two, I would buy two watermelons, two pineapples and two bags of <laughs> blueberry. And this would all be gone at, by the end of the week. And I would go shop. I, I, I had a very high fruit, uh, consumption, no grains though. But what I did notice in my blood work when I was eating a lot of fruit, uh, that I, that has gotten a lot better now that I still eat fruit every day, but it's just, I just didn't, don't eat the massive amounts I used to my ALT levels are it went from like 30s mid 30s and now they're like you know 15 to 20 so and that's you know and talking with robert lustig who would probably be a good guy to have on if you haven't had him had, already yeah, he talks mm -hmm. oh okay mm -hmm. yeah uh you know we were we had dinner together and we're talking about different markers uh, and i was talking i was uh, telling him about some of the observations with uh, hepatic steatosis and non-alcoholic fatty liver that we're seeing in like normal subjects. Like we're not even like reaching out to like people with type two diabetes or obesity in our study. Uh, and he said the ALT is really like the early precursor. Once that starts to climb up and I was telling him, you know, about my ALT levels were, were trending high until I started dialing back. You know, and I think I was just getting, I think that excess amount of fructose from an excess amount of fruit was driving that ALT up. And I think if you were to do an ultrasound or a CT, you probably see the beginnings in a, in a perfectly healthy, you know, 20 exercising 20 year old, 30 year old person. I had their, that the, I had the precursor to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, just based on some of my, I didn't get a scan in my liver. But my, my blood work, from what I know, and talking with him and, and talking with other people, what, was showing an early predictor of, of non-alcoholic fatty liver um, with, Jay, with the high fructose consumption. Yeah. That, I, Jay, do you have uh, any thoughts on, on that? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there's obviously it's tough with N equals ones. Um, I know, Dom, you had also mentioned the Accutane was something that had interfered with your liver uh, function and yeah, increased those but, enzymes. It, they did, but that was like 1992 to 1993. And, and it then, renormalized and then came back up. Uh, they renormalized in about a year or so, uh, but it was like a fairly light dose of Accutane. But mm -hmm. then I, I started getting blood work and I started getting, you know, I was studying biology at the time. So I would always ask my doctor for copies of my blood work, which I encourage everybody listening to this who's getting blood work. Well, I guess they do it all automatically now, but back in the day they did. But when I would go to the doctor, the doctor, be like, I want a copy of my blood work, even in 1992. Uh, so yeah. it's very interesting to see these trends. And because I kept 
all my journals, diet journals and things like that. And my body weight, most of the negative effects I could see is just when my body weight was higher, but I, I am pretty sure I can basically just look at my, the amount of carbs I was buying on my grocery list and, and look at my body weight and see the changes in my blood work. And a lot of the, the things that were creeping up reversed when I started doing low carb. Uh, although, you know, my lipids took, took a different turn in some ways. Triglycerides are still very low, but my HDL went from like 50s to 95. My HDL did. Uh, and But my LDL tripled <laughs> and has, it's it's like, it's still elevated now, uh, but but adding some fruit back in and some carbs back in has has dropped my LDL significantly. So uh, I have blood work scheduled, a very comprehensive blood work scheduled in about three three to four days. So I'm very interested to see the carbs that I'm eating now that I've added back into my diet, how how it's going to impact uh, LDL and ApoB and my NMR lipid profile. So I'll, yeah. I'm going to blog on this soon. So I'll be I'll be writing that. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Uh, as just, just to kind of add in some, some more N equals ones, I suppose I, I work with clients who have fatty liver disease and, and I've seen multiple people with significantly elevated liver enzymes beyond, you know, beyond reference range, be able to get those into range. I've, I've had one client in particular who had severe fatty liver disease shown on the scans and everything and had adenomas. And we were able to get a completely clear scan with no signs of fatty liver or anything. And this was without any restriction in terms of fruit or fruit juice, even, uh, which I think when you like when you but take probably some, drop their body weight, though, right? I mean, a little probably, bit, a, a little bit, is, but um, we're talking maybe like a few pounds. It really didn't it didn't seem to correlate so strongly with with body weight. Um, but I think to and I'm not saying you're doing this, but in general, the picture painted of fructose equals fatty liver or equals increased uric acid is, is another one that's circulating now. I mean, I have my own blood work too, showing very low uric acid, despite eating quite a bit of carbohydrate, like part, quite a bit of carbs, quite a bit of fruit, quite a bit of fruit juice. And I think there's like, we see this in population data as well. A lot of, the, or a handful of the native or indigenous cultures that are very high carb, you know, 70% plus carb intake that have, again, like this narrative that excess carbs leads to the insulin resistant state or leads to the fatty liver state, I think is just an oversimplified model because you, you see those sorts of populations with the most incredible glucose tolerance, you know, showing really, really great, uh, ability to oxidize carbohydrate with very small changes in, in blood sugar. You know, this is the Katavins, a couple of cultures in Africa, the, the Bantu and the Tuki Senta, um, which, you know, we have the research showing that. And there's also, there's a really great uh, article by Denise Minger uh, titled In Defense of Low Fat. And there's a, a subtitle to it. I don't remember the second part. And she was someone who was also, you know, had very much fallen into the low carb, high fat world as what the way that most people market it. Not, again, not saying you at all, Dom, because you don't do this, but people who market it as this is the optimal diet for everybody. This is the optimal way to live. This is how we always did it. You know, we are tuned to very low carb, very high fat. And she points out some extreme examples on the other end that just, uh, I think are so in your face, so blatant that it's hard to ignore them. So there's uh, like the Walter Kempner diet, which this was this maybe like 1950s, 1960s. I don't remember the exact uh, years, but he was, putting people who had diabetes, high blood pressure, like all sorts of metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular risk factors. I don't remember if it was people with cardiovascular disease as well on very, very high carbohydrate diets above 500 grams of carbs per day with that were coming from rice, fruit, fruit juice, and large amounts of refined sugar. Uh, he basically said between hundred, well, the refined sugar was ad libitum. So he basically didn't restrict how much refined sugar someone could have. And we can definitely say that a lot of people would say what you had mentioned, Don, which is what about the weight loss? Like some of these people lost hundred plus pounds. So that's this huge confounding variable, but there was, he was actually able to show that in some of the diabetic patients or people who had diabetes that didn't have the weight loss, they were still able to get off their exogenous insulin. They were still able to see some dramatic improvements in insulin resistance that are sometimes said to be nearly impossible. You know, if you talk to a typical uh, you know, an average medical doctor who says, you know, who has a patient who has, who's on, who has type one diabetes is on insulin because of it. 
you know, they're not saying that that's something you're going to get off of. Um, but Walter Kemner was doing that with very, very high carb diets, a lot of refined sugar, a lot of fructose intake. And there's a handful of others that uh, Denise Minter points to in that article. There's Roy Swank and, and the Pritikin diet and a couple others that I think are just some pretty notable examples. And it is something is this was- in the published literature, like, like peer reviewed trials, or is it in a, in a book? Cause I mean, with diabetes management, it, I mean, it really does come down to carb management type one diabetes. Uh, but there are many ways, but, and I think you're probably getting to this point is to increase insulin sensitivity. And I think maybe that's, that's what they're, I mean, people can have great effects just on a, on a a potato diet, you know, but typically, uh, and you talked about excess carbs and no alcoholic fatty liver in some of those populations, but those populations are weight stable. So whenever you're getting excess carbohydrates, the, the surplus amount of calories from excess carbohydrates will indefinitely be stored in the liver once glycogen is topped off. And then you'll start seeing uh, you know, and I think that comes down to each person will need to titrate the amount of carbohydrates to optimize maximum carbohydrate consumption, but to minimize surplus carbohydrates beyond topping off glycogen, because that gets deposited in the liver and will through de novo lipogenesis, will start creating a fatty liver, right? I mean, that's, yes. that's kind of my, my academic understanding of it. Uh, although we had weight stable people in our group pre low carb that had fatty liver. So, and they were, I think pretty much weight stable. So I think these things kind of creep up and what we don't know, I'd like to hear your thoughts on people who are weight stable, people who are eating a balanced diet that they, they have the precursor to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, probably just shy of fibrosis, but why this is happening is quite a debate right now. And I don't have answers to it, but I'd like to hear your, your thoughts on that. Yeah. And, and another, so another point I would, I'm definitely happy to talk about that. Cause I think it's a great point that so many people are not metabolically healthy and it, and that at least, you know, the assumption is, oh, well, if you're weight stable, at least then you probably are. But I think that as you're saying, we can certainly challenge that assumption uh, or the data challenges that assumption. Yeah. Uh, but in fatty liver disease, I've also seen some papers, um, some really great papers showing that only about 25% of the fat in the fatty liver is from fructose, where 60 so the rest is coming from fat, about 15% is from the dietary fat, so less than the mm -hmm. dietary fructose, but 60% is yeah. from our own body fat stores due to the high levels of lipolysis that are going on because of the, the highly stressed state, the, the high cortisol and high adrenaline and the dysfunction at the liver. So that fat gets taken up and then isn't well exported. It's not being able to be oxidized well, and you end up uh, storing it as fat. And I think, so, so to your point, yes, fructose can be converted to fat through de novo lipogenesis. That's not going to be its primary pathway. I mean, normally we're talking a very low percentage of fructose that'll be converted to fat unless there is major dysfunction going on. We have pretty, uh, pretty great capacity for storing glycogen and uh, converting that uh, glucose as well, or fructose to glycogen. We can convert it to glucose. We can convert it to lactate and export it. And we'll definitely use those pathways before we're converting any large amounts of fructose. And I think most of the suggestion that very large amounts are going to be converted to fat is coming from the rat studies or rodent studies where we're looking at pure fructose uh, intake or m massive amounts of fructose, you know, hundreds and hundreds of, of grams of fructose beyond what anybody is consuming, you know, normally. But again, almost every time it's, it's uh, pure fructose and there's this huge confounding variable of poor absorption and increased endotoxin, increased lipopolysaccharide production in those states. And so I'm not saying a low carb, high fat diet is going to cause fatty liver either, just because like, if we want to say, all right, in fatty liver, 75% of that fat is from fat, not fructose. I'm not saying, all right, it's that simple. Just don't eat fat. Not at all. I, I think instead we want to focus on those actual processes that would lead the liver to be storing fat as opposed to oxidizing the carb and, or storing it as glycogen or oxidizing the fat or what's leading to the excess fat circulation, um, which is something that's correlated with insulin resistance and diabetes. And I think, point. Hey, Jay, what do you think? Uh, not, not to interject, but just quickly, uh, 
Well, I, I think an energy balance, you know, surplus calories would contribute to fatty liver, but also this idea of just basically enhancing the liver function. So there are many factors in in our environment that in impairing liver function and some of the there are some agents out there that can reverse not too many of them but uh, but i think just improving our liver function uh could be one way to and that could be i don't know uh alpha lipoic acid or you know there's some stuff with resveratrol and, and other uh, drug compounds too that we could talk about that independent of any change in diet you give the compound and you can start to reverse you know fatty liver so i, I think a lot of it too is just maybe just a lot of people are medicated and they're taking drugs that are through first pass metabolism impairing liver function and and this is backing up the liver and causing a redox shift in the liver essentially de-energizing the liver and uh you know uh fat oxidation in the liver gluconeogenesis uh ketogenesis and many of these these processes are very very energy dependent and if we're on if we're consuming alcohol if we're consuming different drugs i i think that this is a contributing factor and maybe not talked about as much as it should be because i've seen people get off drugs and they didn't really change their diet and then you know, their liver, uh, fatty liver reverse too. Um, so to, I'm just throwing that in there to get, I want to get your comments on, on that. Yeah. Jay. Yeah. And, and what did you do with those clients? You know, you know, you mentioned those clients that you helped, um, you know, get rid of fatty liver, um, without maybe te technically bringing carbs mm -hmm. down. What, what did you do with them? Yeah. And yeah. And I guess that, that's a good question too, Brian, because I think they go together. So I totally yeah. agree that where we should place our, like at the best place to place our focus, at least the cent most central place is let's restore that liver function. And let's first look at the dysfunction that happens there. So as you said, we think of fatty liver as a situation where there's this overflow of energy. And so it just gets stored as fat. But what we tend to see is lower ATP levels, a lot of oxidative stress, a lot of reactive oxygen species mm -hmm. and impairments in the mitochondrial function. So we're not oxidizing the, the carb or fat well, and then it's getting stored. And we also see a huge shift toward lipid oxidation. So this is one of those, I think, really key examples where we see that the carb oxidation tends to be, I would say, the more sensitive where that's going to be blocked first. And then we kind of resort to the fat burning. And so we think if we're storing a lot of fat in the liver, we aren't burning a lot of fat, but actually what, tend, what we tend to see is way elevated levels of lipid, peroxi, or lipid oxidation, so fat burning, and the lipid storage at the same time, uh, and the elevated stress hormones and the dysfunction, the oxidative stress, all those things. Again, not saying this is caused by the fat. And yeah, I think looking at medications that are going to be liver toxic essentially is, is a, a good place to start for sure. And I would be considering other aspects of diet and lifestyle that are going to contribute there as well. So a lot of people point to a lack of movement, a lack of sleep. I think those things are, are going to be central factors. Uh, I would be looking at nutrients. So vitamin E, yeah. a handful of B vitamins uh, are all going to be central to restoring liver function if those are deficient. Taurine is another one that has a lot of benefits in fatty liver disease. Yeah. And uh, some of these, you know, you might, somebody might want to look to supplementation, but uh, also from the diet, making sure that our nutritional status is good, I think is a, is something that a lot of people are probably lacking. Uh, the other thing too, so there's two other, other central pieces here, which tend to be ones that I go on about a lot, ones that we very briefly touched on when we talked last one is the polyunsaturated fats that I do think are implicated in fatty liver disease, um, you know, studies. And again, we don't have these models in humans, but looking at rats with a highly saturated fat intake versus a highly polyunsaturated fat intake and seeing much greater progression of fatty liver disease on the unsaturated fat side, or sometimes the saturated fat, even being protective, uh, against alcohol, for example, uh, or other things that would create a fatty liver state. So I think that that is a point that I would argue for is that even in the people who are weight stable, I think the huge increase in polyunsaturated fats, this is the omega sixes and omega threes for someone who isn't familiar with those, uh, in the diet that we're seeing, especially in the United States, uh, is a huge culprit. I would, I would argue. And, uh, and the other would be coming back to the endotoxemia, the lipopolysaccharide where the average person is not 
septic, but I do think there's good suggestion of low grade endotoxemia in states of insulin resistance and fatty liver disease. And mechanistically, we can see that as a lone way like that on its own can essentially cause a fatty liver state. And so I think that's something that we want to consider is what sorts of foods are we consuming that could be driving an imbalanced or a poor, you know, poor balanced uh, microbiome. And I think part of the benefit of a low carb diet and why people see a lot of benefits is they tend to avoid those, those factors, or they tend to have some benefits in the gut microbiome. And I think that's probably going to reduce endotoxin. And I would say, and to come back to the example you mentioned, Brian, uh, or the example I mentioned is with this client, she was dealing with a lot of gut symptoms, a lot of gut symptoms. And so removing things that had been major culprits driving that. So in her case, removing the breads and grains, uh, gluten was something she was not responding well to. And she was dealing with a lot of reflux, which again, could come back to already the fatty liver issues because you tend not to produce bile, uh, adequately. And so that's going to lead to impaired fat digestion. So shifting the types of fats was, was a factor. Uh, and sometimes when people are really sensitive, there, I lean more toward monounsaturated fats than even saturated because those tend to be a little bit easier to digest. Uh, but I'm also a fan of the saturated fats in most cases. So in her case, it was shifting away from the polyunsaturated fats using supplements like B vitamins, taurine. Uh, I believe she was, she might've been on Tugka instead of taurine or maybe it was just taurine plus the UDCA, the, uh, or C deoxycholic acid, which is normally given for fatty liver, um, don't remember all the other details of the of the like supplements that might have been used, but I I know that we were seeing major resolution in gut symptoms, which I think was a was a huge factor. And shifting the the types of foods to increase the availability of nutrients, and you know some shifts in lifestyle. But at, but it wasn't reducing the total carbon take. If anything, I think it stayed the same, maybe even increased. I'd have to look back at the the food tracking, but uh, shifting actually more toward fructose containing carbohydrates, more toward fruits and juices over, I think, uh, over the grains, which I think in her case, were causing some major issues. Hey, uh, Jay, do you, are you using any of these, like, uh, I have an omega three index test kit. Are you measuring these polyunsaturated fatty acids in people? I mean, it's kind of a big part of the research that I actually predates all the keto stuff. I was very interested in, in PUFAs from a membrane component, because we'd have artificial membranes and, um, you know, and, and in our model systems, we have these chambers, right? And then we increase oxygen from hypoxia to graded levels to like zero, 20, 40, 60, 100, and then we go to hyperbaric. And we see that membrane lipid peroxidation, and we, we've developed different techniques for that, directly correlates to membrane PUFA levels. So uh, these were a number of grants that I submitted that did not get funded because the reviewers would just point to data saying, hey, you know, polyunsaturated fatty in humans, I I'd point to my data and some of the animal data, but they would point and say, hey, PUFA levels, uh, higher PUFA levels correlate with longevity as well, well omega-3 levels. So, I mean, so, you know, I don't know what your thoughts on on omega-6 to omega-3, uh, but many human randomized clinical trials, there's a massive amount of data that omega-3 levels in the blood and in the tissues correlate with longevity, about a two, well, depending on what study, 2.2 years of extra life to some studies say five years of extra life, the higher the PUFAs you have, the higher the omega-3s you have. So, I, I mean, that's not talking about omega-6s, but what are your thoughts on that? Like, I, I mean, because I was almost going to build a whole research program on kind of like anti-PUFAs, but uh, because our the lab data shows it, but the human clinical trials basically shows the higher PUFAs you have, you know, the greater, the better, you know, your health biomarkers improve dramatically, the higher, you know, PUFAs you have. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I I, I love the, the thought process that you were having there. And I just, I don't, I've tested... I've done one of the finger prick tests with, I think it was through Genova where they tested. Yeah. Genova fatty acids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I don't, it's not something I use with most clients, but I don't, I don't know if you, is that looking at, I would assume it's looking at serum uh, values, which I don't know how uh, well that would correlate. Th this is, this is a blood spot kit. Uh, actually, I think Rhonda Patrick had mentioned it to me and uh, mine's being, 
analyzed right now. And is so, it serious? So they're not looking at the the composition whole, whole of the blood. phospholipid. Though. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, actually. Uh, so uh, you can, when you submit your sample, they can just give you a comprehensive analysis of the omega threes and omega sixes, or you can check the box, and then they could do a whole uh, lipidomic analysis of it. So uh, I actually check the box, and I'm having extra uh, analysis. I have done my own metabolomic profile, just taking my own blood, spinning it down <laughs> and sending it not to a clinical lab, but to like basic science. But yeah, this will do, uh, I'm paying a little bit extra and they're going to do a whole fatty acid analysis. So I'm, I'm kind of curious because I do eat, I, I'm not a big fan of fish oil supplements unless you're not eating fish. If you don't have any fish in your diet, then I would want to get some omega-3s in there to just offset the omega omega sixes that are permeate the diet but uh but i do eat a lot of fatty fish and i do so i, I would expect my omega threes would be pretty high and from my understanding i mean that that's the higher omega threes if you go to the human clinical trials uh you know the higher omega three content in your blood and tissues that that confers a significant longevity advantage i mean just google like omega threes and lifespan and you come up with a lot of legit human clinical trials. But I can tell you from being in the lab that if you're studying oxygen toxicity, you want lower PUFA levels like in your, but but we have not done the human trials on the animal models that we have, have done, but experimentally, I mean, we see it. Yeah, yeah. And it, I, so a couple of confounding variables that come to mind with the human data. I mean, I think if you, Took and took the population of, in the states and said, if you can, like whoever can look at people and how at their fish consumption, right, or looking at their fish oil consumption as well, even if they're taking fully oxidized omega three fish oil from you know which has been shown in various studies, a lot of the major products are already oxidized, you know, already having those lipid peroxide products. Even I think even if you looked at the correlation between longevity and a product that was even potentially harmful, I bet there would still be. A benefit looking at longevity because of the healthy user bias, right? Like those people who are consuming fish oil or who are eating more fish are, I think, probably more health conscious, more active, probably lower body weight. I don't know in those studies how much yeah. they controlled. I would well, assume they tried to. I, I'd like to things. add, yeah, that uh, I don't think there was like a particular benefit benefit to fish oil supplementation. So. Hmm. You know, these people that had two or three times higher levels of omega-3 just for eating more fish, they weren't mm. supplementing, which I'm a, I'm a big believer in just getting what you can from food. I mean, I eat tons of eggs, liver, oysters, uh, sardines, and things like that. And then I've done micronutrient profile. If I eat a lot of liver, my vitamin A and other things start to get too high. And I think that's equally as bad. But uh, then you become, you know, you have hypervitaminosis, which I think is probably not a good thing. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I mean, this idea of just, we want to jack our omega-3 levels as high as possible because the human data is very clear that the higher it is, it confers a longevity advantage. Uh, you, you know, I, I have seen some of the opposite stuff in our experimental models with just proof of causing membrane oxidation. But, uh, but I think, What's the PUFA con important. I'm sorry, Dom. What's the PUFA content in um like salmon, wild salmon? Do we like in wild salmon? Uh yeah, I guess it's different. You know, I guess it depends on where you get your source. Uh I, I eat know. salmon maybe once or twice a month, but I do eat sardines probably about, you know, I don't I have mackerel in my bag now. So I eat mackerel or sardines a couple times a week. I do that too. Sometimes, uh, yeah. yeah. It's, it's easy. I, it's, and it's, and people who it's yeah. cost effect, it's not that expensive, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Canned fish. I mean, some people have things against canned fish, but, uh, canned fish is typically frozen immediately. Uh, as soon as it's caught, it's just thrown into a freezer and, and then it's, it's, it's cooked and it has pretty low, uh, uh, oxidize omega-3s i mean uh and and that's the problem i think with polyunsaturated fatty acids right is that when you go to a restaurant and in some restaurants you could literally just smell it i mean there's a couple of restaurants that we have our, our our business mailing uh there and i walk by it and you could just smell i when you study these things you kind of 
understand the smell of certain uh, oxidized fatty acids and, and things like acrolein. And, and, you know, when you tinker around these things and you have them in jars and you, you work in a lab, you just know that that's, that's a very bad destructive smell. And I think once you stimulate uh, oxidized polyunsaturated fatty acids, it's like a this futile chain reaction that can cause, and, and I, I attribute some of my health problems maybe 15 years ago uh, to eating like higher uh, omega-6 oils and which I, when I phased out, it reversed some of some of the symptoms. It could have been other things too, but maybe there's a correlation there. But uh, but I, at the problem, my 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 biggest concern with polyunsaturated fatty acids is not the the not the products on the shelves per se, but when these things are heated. When these things are heated, then they become you know very toxic to the body. Uh, yeah, because so they're. It, they're in almost everything. <laughs> like you go yeah. to the store, like the like the vegetable oils, you know. Yeah, but they're not oxidized on the shelf. I, I, I don't think. I I thought that that was a problem. Uh, but if you take these products off the shelf and look at them, they're not oxidized. But you know, people cook with them, then it becomes a problem. Or people reusing, like these restaurants are probably the worst offenders, where they're just reusing the oil, and cooking things in it. Then that becomes a huge problem, I think. Uh, but I know there's a big discussion about, you know, polyunsaturated fatty acids and I'm a little bit on the fence about it. I do think it's a problem. I think just if we can reduce the consumption of these things, because once they get into the body and incorporated into membranes, then they, you know, then you're hypersaturating the membrane with a higher percentage of a fatty acid that has a greater potential to be oxidized. And I think I think people who are metabolically healthy, low inflammation, high endogenous antioxidant function, I think they will be okay. But the majority of our population is not metabolically healthy. So if you're saturating our biological membranes with a polyunsaturated fatty acid that has the propensity to be oxidized in a metabolically unhealthy person, then that's like that's like lighter fluid on the gas on the fire. You know, I think that's a huge problem. And I think I think it's an underrepresented problem that needs to, I know some people are drawing more attention to it. I talked to Kate Shanahan and, and some other people. Um, Jay, what are your thoughts but, on, I know you've taught, you've, you yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, so I, I, I'm a, I'm concerned about them, even if they're not oxidized, even if, so I know for some of the fish oil products, there is some of the research looking at them has found, that they are already damaged or all, all already um, some of them are already oxidized, but even if we took it in from salmon, which I know your question, Brian, what about like wild salmon? And I'm sure it varies based on the individual one. I just pulled up the nutrition data for uh, Atlantic wild raw salmon, which is still high fat and, and looking at about 40% PUFA, which about 80% of that is the omega threes. And to your point, Dom, I'm even if it's fully intact and not oxidized by the time we consume it. And by the time it goes through our digest digestive tract, the amount of PUFA we eat will influence the amount of PUFA in our membranes. And that's going to leave those more susceptible to damage in that situation. And I would say, even if someone's healthy, there's still always going to be some amount of reactive oxygen species, some amount of oxidative stress, whether it's happening in bursts due to exercise or anything else. And I would say those are situations where then every time that's happening, the more unsaturated those membranes are, the more susceptible they are to, inf to inflammation, to oxidative stress, to amplifying that signal. And I think that that's concerning to me. I think that I would argue that that's something that would drive someone to become less metabolically healthy. And I know it, we can't look at human data for this, but uh, because as you were saying, like some of the correlations aren't that clear or, or are maybe even suggesting the opposite, but well, I think there are. The, yeah. That's like highly suggestive that, you know, the more fish and omega threes you get, like there's multiple, like huge studies that just convert a longevity advantage. And, uh, so, yep. but I mean, there could be a healthy user bias, but I think they account for a lot of that. So I, I think it'd be good to, to revisit some of that. Yeah, I think it'd be, I would love to, to, I'll have to dive into some of those studies. I'd be curious to know, like, how much did they account for something like healthy user bias? Because I think that that's the first thing in my mind would go to. But when we look, and I know I referenced him last time, AJ Holbert, he has, uh, he's put forth what's called the membrane pacemaker uh, theory of aging. 
I believe is, is what it's called. And uh, he's basically looked across all, not all species, but you know, data across tons of different species and was building upon the oxidative stress theory of aging, the uh, also the metabolic, what's the, not the metabolic theory, but the, the one where they're looking at, at total energy expenditure and basically found that the line fits way better when we're looking at the peroxidation and in, peroxidation index of the membranes and lifespan. And basically at that value can account for the differences in lifespan between species and also within species. And all of the things that all of the ones that were outliers before, so various types of birds and naked mole rats and things like that, which have very high metabolic rates relative, or sorry, uh, very high lifespans relative to their metabolic rate relative to their size, which is those are outliers and we're you know outliers there as well. They don't become outliers when you account for the peroxidation index of the membranes. And he makes the argument that for one, the omega threes would be potentially worse, and there's more of an association with DHA because it's more susceptible to the peroxidation than the omega threes, uh, and or than the omega sixes. But I would say both are concerning to me. And, and I think that data is, is uh, conflicts with, with the, uh, apparently the, the omega three data in humans that we, I would want to take a look at and see where are they measuring the omega threes and what are those confounding variables? Because in other species, including, and looking at the proxation index of human typical, you know, mitochondrial membranes compared to other species it is able to account for the lifespan where the lower the peroxidation index is, basically the more saturated the membranes, the longer lifespan and the slower aging. And, you know, he points to a few mechanisms, one of them being the susceptibility to peroxidation, one of them being the permeability to protons and to ions like sodium, uh, which basically reduce the efficiency of respiration. So we lose the, uh, the proton gradient because of the permeability at the inner mitochondrial membrane due to the polyunsaturated fats. So we don't produce the ATP as efficiently. Uh, and then also losing energy essentially due to the permeability of the, of the other ions. And there's a couple other, other, uh, points he, he suggests as far as why this can account for, uh, the difference in lifespan and aging and drive degeneration. But basically the, you know, corroborating exactly what you were finding in the data that you had, Dom, um, uh, on of course the non-human subjects. And I think, there would have to be some well, dramatic I, reason. Like, just yeah. real quick, I, I would just want to say, like, there would have to be some dramatic reason why it would be different in humans versus other species, and I don't know of any reason that we could point to why that would be the case. And I think that's why I would look more to like something like healthy user bias being a confounding variable as opposed to it just being that we react differently than every other species. Yeah, I mean, well, you just got to point to people who are just eating, subsiding only on fatty fish for their subsistence, and you know they tend to do very well, right? But but I think there was a, a couple big studies, just Google like omega-3 fatty acids and longevity. Uh, I remember I have a folder somewhere on my computer. Uh, one study was done at Tufts, but there were like multi-site studies that the data was clear. Some say it's a 2.2 years of extra age. And some studies say it's greater than five years of longevity, at, you know, the higher your omega-3s. Uh, and, you know, just to preface it, we, I, I study, the membrane levels of omega threes in the context of elevated partial pressure of oxygen, right? So uh, basically, uh, my project was to look at you know membrane lipid peroxidation uh, in the context of metabolic stress. But I think you know if we direct this back to the person who's metabolically unhealthy eating copious amounts of salmon or other, or taking fish oil supplements, which is probably uh, a bad thing in the context of, of, you know, maybe drinking alcohol, which can oxidize, you know, the omega threes in the liver and things like that. I think there's a study on that. Then I think it becomes a problem. I think it's the, it's the excess consumption of polyunsaturated fatty acids, more so omega six, but maybe omega three, in the context of metabolic dysfunction. And then that if the mitochondria are dysfunctional, they create more reactive oxygen species. And then you have the, the, the membrane uh, lipid peroxidation, but you know, you can't, you can't ignore the human studies showing that higher omega threes correlate to greater longevity. So I think it'd be good to further deconstruct that. But I know a lot of people are, are working on it, but I, I don't think there, I don't think people should be worried about 
uh, consuming omega-3s in fish. Uh, I think they need to be very picky when it comes to picking a fish oil supplement because, yeah, some may be oxidized. And if they're getting like very low omega-3s in the diet, then they may want to consider supplementing. Or, I mean, if you have depression or other neurological disorders, have been shown to be responsive to omega-3 therapy. So DHA and, and EPA, I think for like things like depression, anxiety, you know, there has it, there's a clinical benefit there. Uh, but, but I think, uh, you know, I think people just get carried away with omega-3s and mega dosing uh, supplement. I, I, I don't think that's a, that's a good thing. Yeah. Well, but, in this, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, and, and, Fatty fish tastes better. Uh, my my wife cooked a big cod fillet, and I was eating it, and it's just like, man, this is nothing like the trout or the salmon. Uh, yeah. It's just a very lean, uh, you know. Uh, I mean, I, I like eating all sorts of fish, but I would gravitate towards a fatty fish. Uh, I don't necessarily buy it from the market that often. It's more of like a, a luxury thing on the weekends or something. But uh, but I do eat canned fish quite often and uh i'm very curious to to see my omega-3 omega-6 analysis from this test because i can't really say but besides doing metabolomics on myself a couple times i haven't really done uh used these tests before so i'm going to do this and i'll probably do the genova test too and see see what my levels are yeah yeah i'd be curious to to hear how that goes that was, this test here, no, I don't have any, you know. What's the, what's, the, what's the brand on it? On the, on uh, it's called Omega, Omega Quat. I don't know if that's okay. reversed upside down or whatever. Oh, that's good, Omega. that's good. Yeah, yeah. I, I posted about it uh, just because I wanted to get, I, I just posted it on my Twitter and I asked people if they use the test and I got an overwhelming response and a couple private messages saying, you know, here's the analysis and everything. So, and I think it was Rhonda Patrick that maybe had mentioned this to me to look into it because I made a note on it. So I want to compare this and I, I, I'm a big fan of Genova testing too. So I'm going to uh, probably do their test as well. And, and just to look at the levels. And I was just going to say, I think, I think in the context of eating fish, I think if someone's coming from a standard American diet and they want to implement some fish into their diet, you know, <clears throat> again, the sourcing of the fish is a big issue too. That's a whole nother topic yeah. about where that fish is coming from. I had the uh, owner of Cetopia. It's another cool brand. If you want to, if you, if you love like sushi grade, Dom, you would love this company. Mm -hmm. uh, they make pretty much sushi grade fish and it's farm raised, but it's actually raised in an environment that they should be eating in. Oh, yeah, um, so it's right. controlled. So you're not dealing with microplastics and things like that. And every fish is tested for heavy metals and things like that. Oh, yeah. So really cool company. And I've been getting their orders probably bi-monthly. Yeah. So. Yeah, the heavy metal thing is something I remember when I was on the Joe Rogan podcast, maybe it was before we jumped on or maybe during during the podcast, he said he was eating sardines and maybe from my recommendation or something like that. But then his uh, his arsenic levels and maybe something else was off the charts. And, you know, I, I eat uh, wild planet sardines. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. You know, I have been, you know, I'm going to maybe plug this company because uh, seasons, uh, mackerel. So I have I have a, like an Amazon subscription to this and I've been eating massive amounts of it. And then we were traveling to like Dominican Republic and I had a whole week of just eating massive amounts of fish. And I was like, this would be a good time to check my heavy metals. <laughs> so when I got back, I went to Quest Labs, had a pretty comprehensive, I did a hair analysis and I did the Quest Lab analysis and my heavy metals were low and that's eating massive amounts of this Mackerel. So either I, either this has super low heavy metals uh i was also eating wild planet so uh okay. so if this if these fish had heavy metals or wild planet had heavy metals it would definitely show because i eat a massive amount of of both but i came from the caribbean and uh you know i was eating massive amounts of fish and it yeah. didn't show up on uh, I had been, you know, eating these fish for like decades now, but, uh, so That's one you know, thing you, I, go ahead, I eat no. small fish, I eat kind of smaller fish so that I do not eat swordfish. I do not eat, uh, a lot of a larger predatory fish. So I don't want to make a recommendation that people go out and just eat massive amounts of fish, but I'm just telling you from my personal experience and eating 
very large amounts of fish. I don't think heavy metals are a problem, but I could just have very good detoxification pathways. Right. So, you know, I, I cautiously recommend, I, I think there are legitimate benefits to eating fish. Um, but I think people just have to be cautious and have to do testing to, to make sure because yeah. here, I was listening here. to yeah, Anthony Robbins said he almost died <laughs> of, of, if you, I was reading his book, uh, life force and he said yeah, mercury, he right? died of heavy metal poisoning and he was eating, oh, he was eating swordfish or something. And I've been in, people have emailed me with their, their labs showing toxicity to heavy metals uh, eating. I, I don't know exactly what brand of fish or what kind of fish they're eating, but it's a very real problem. But I think you just have to be very selective of the companies and the type of fish you're eating. Jay, anything else you want to add on this? <clears throat> Yeah, I would just, yeah, my only, th you know, I still personally would have some caution around the omega-3s. I, I know what you're saying, maybe in the quintessential healthy person who knows that they're fully metabolically healthy and isn't going to be exposed to a lot of oxidative stress, I think. So for one, what I would say is in a lot of, I think, Dom, you had alluded to like depression and other, uh, I don't know if it was mental health states or also like neurodegenerative uh, disorders, but in those situations, we tend to see, see elevated levels of the oxidized omega threes. We tend to see the acrolein, the you know the HNE, um, it, it, the melanodialdehyde, and so that would be situations where again I would be even more hesitant in that state to be exposing myself to elevated levels of omega threes, uh, knowing especially I know we wanted to talk about this coming in. I mean, knowing the associations in depression with mitochondrial dysfunction and with elevated oxidative stress. I mean, I would say these are situations where we want to be even more careful. And that's a good point. But I want to add in many cases, at least the published studies for depression or some other things, they were reversing a deficiency, meaning that they kind of came in, they measured and they, they had low levels of omega threes. And then through supplementation, they elevated them and then saw like the, the, the benefits, you know, the, the behavioral benefits, but these are people probably with horrible diets coming in and then the, the supplement, uh, moved the needle on, on that. And, uh, I think I, Andrew Huberman was mentioning some studies that I looked into and, and a few other studies showing that, but, um, uh, it could just be, you know, uh, in the context of pushing down omega-6s in favor of omega-3 is that balance in the body, something like that. So that that's kind of what I was thinking when I was reading the studies, but I'll have to go back and delve into the methodology. Yeah. Yeah, possibly. I, I know I've seen also some papers challenging the, the evidence for fish oil supplementation helping with depression. Um, you know, and I know we're just kind of throwing like, I know this study, this study, maybe we'll mm -hmm. send some over to Brian or, or something. You can post them in the notes. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Any study you want me, you want me to post? Yeah. Let me know. Well, I, I, yeah, for epilepsy, I was, uh, the chair of the American Epilepsy Society special interest group. So AES is like this huge conference, mostly like drug based <laughs> conference, but they kind of marginalized the dietary therapy section. So they put us at like seven in the morning, but we had a speaker that was, he wasn't talking about the ketogenic diet, which most of the speakers do because it's, it's an epilepsy conference, but his, his presentation was just strictly on uh, DHA and EPA. And he gave a very compelling presentation that independent of a ketogenic diet that DHA and EPA has anti-seizure effects uh, through a number of different mechanisms and did a very elegant study. So I, I do think that the fatty acid composition of a ketogenic diet when used therapeutically uh, really does need to be taken into account because early studies used very high levels of, of omega-6 fatty acids. I mean, hydrogenated soybean oil or soybean was like one of the first ingredients in some of these prescription medical foods, which yeah. were basically the, the three to one to four to one ratio. But surprisingly, they actually had, a, they worked. I, I don't think they worked as, as well as like a whole food formulated ketogenic diet, but but there were some anomalies in the blood work, which are published. And actually it was Dr. Veach who point, pointed some of this stuff out to me, um, with, especially with the tri elevated triglycerides. Um, so yeah, I, I think there needs to be a greater appreciation for the fatty acid composition. I'm in favor of saturated fats and monounsaturated fats as basically being your primary fuels. Um, 
infer. And I know, I don't know what the current guide, guidelines are something like seven to 10% uh, or less of saturated fat, but I think probably 20% is probably a, a good estimate. But with the balance of being a heavy monounsaturated fat, uh, would be your your fuel source. I get this question a lot, like what should be the primary fatty acid for for like ketogenic diet? And you want to dial back to some extent the saturated fatty, but get a large amount of mono and and you know the your polyunsaturated fatty acids are your essential fatty acids, but you just need to prevent a deficiency of them. You don't need to get you don't have to like think of them as like your fuel, your macronutrient, like you don't want to get calories from PUFAs. You just want to make sure you're not deficient in it because uh, I, I, I do believe just based upon the research that we've done that a high PUFA membrane content will, will oxidize in the presence of metabolic arrangement. Yeah. And, and as far as, you know, if we want to say just enough to prevent any deficiency based, you know, based on what's suggested as possible deficiency there, I mean, yeah. We're talking very tiny amounts, as you were saying, not getting any, even like calories from it. Really, we're talking you know, 0.1% of the diet, something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. and, and if we're eating, as you said, whole foods, and it's not a super low fat diet, I think it's nearly impossible not to reach that point anyway. If you're eating dairy and, and meat and seafood, even if it's not the fatty fish, even if it's the leaner fish, you know, the mahi mahi and cod, which I know you weren't <laughs> the biggest fan of, uh, or halibut or whatever it is. It just don't taste that good. So I, but I, like, you know, I personally don't like salmon. So, <laughs> oh, wow. but I don't love cod either. I, I really like, you know, like I like mahi mahi and grouper and halibut a lot, uh, as far as low fat yeah. uh, fish go. But, uh, but anyway, yeah. So I think even if you're getting, or, you know, as you mentioned, oysters or mussels or shrimp, you know, any of those options are still going to be overall very, very low in the polyunsaturated fats and still will, will do more than enough as far as meeting the absolute essential needs, assuming that there are some, which yeah, if, if there are, they're very, very low. So I thought maybe we could finish up with, uh, and this is, we could probably talk for another hour, but we'll, I thought we could maybe finish up. It's interesting. I was just doing a little bit of research before the interview and I was, I just watched a video, you know, on YouTube. It's like nowadays you can go down a rabbit hole and find what you want. If you really want to find it, you know, like, totally. but, um, it was this, this physician, he was talking about, do we really need carbs? And he was just going through uh, a whole litany of reasonings why, you know, you need proteins, you need fats, you know, for hormonal health. Um, both omega three and omega six, and he was like, "Do we need carbs?" You know, it's like people make the argument, "Do we need carbs for energy?" And he was, and um, just making this whole argument for also, "Do we need carbs for thyroid function?" Um, and I know these are a lot of different topics, but you know, a lot of people will say, "Well, you know, carbs aren't essential." Um, you know, you can live off, uh, you know, fats and protein, and um, I know you guys have come from both sides of the spectrum. Um, and maybe there's not a perfect answer and everyone's a little bit different perhaps, but I'm just wondering, maybe we can just, Jay, maybe just start off as to your reasoning behind, you know, why you shouldn't be too extreme on one end and, and your reasoning behind, uh, the reasoning behind, uh, carb intake and things like that. So, yeah, there's a lot of arguments for or against, as you're saying anything, right. As far as that argument against carbohydrates, I think it's the weakest of them or one of the weakest to suggest that, that because they're not essential, that essential to our diet, that that means that we shouldn't consume them. Uh, because so for one, if we look at fat intake, the only essential fats are the polyunsaturated fats. So there's no essentiality as far as monounsaturated oh, okay. or saturated fats. And again, when I say essential, this doesn't mean essential to the, to our physiology, it means essential to our diet. So what that means is that as long as we get our 0.1% of our diet from a little bit of omega-6 and omega-3, then we don't need any fat. So it's such a small amount, I, could, I would even say, all right, it's, fats are barely essential. But that doesn't mean that we don't use fats in a ton of places and they're not necessary for our physiology. In the same way that that's the case for carbs, the difference is, or the, I guess the exact same situation in both of those is we can produce fat and carbohydrates endogenously. We just can't produce the omega threes and omega sixes, although we can produce omega nines. So there's even, again, some question as far as, uh, you know, if we produce those are, are the threes and sixes essential, but again, we're talking about 0.1% anyway. So the point I'm getting at is that what that argument is not saying is that carbs are not essential to our physiology, because when we don't consume carbs, we go to great lengths to produce them. 
We convert, you know, oftentimes it's mostly from amino acids, but we'll also use the glycerol backbones from fat, uh, from triglyceride to produce uh, carbs through gluconeogenesis to a pretty decent amount. And it will reduce when we're on a ketogenic diet, but it's still like, you know, still a pretty decent amount of, of carbs that we have to produce that are absolutely essential. And they're not only essential for the brain, which does need at least a portion of glucose, you know, at least talking about 30% of its fuel needs needing to come from glucose. But if we're not in the extreme state where we're producing ketones, it's going to be about a hundred or nearly, uh, you know, we talked last time, like lactate and, and other things or some minor fuels there. But to suggest that because we don't have to eat them, that means that they aren't beneficial is I think just a very weak argument when we consider that they, they play very necessary roles in our physiology as well. And uh, I said in a paper in one of the podcast episodes, I'll, I'll uh, just pull up the title now, but it talks about, you know, even just in the brain, how necessary uh, glucose is for, for producing certain neurotransmitters and things like that. So it's titled sugar for the brain, the role of glucose in physiological and pathological brain function. Just again, something that points to the, some of the necessary roles of, of carbohydrate, even outside of a fuel, but this isn't saying anything about anyway, to come back to the, to the basis of the argument, this isn't saying anything about what is ideally healthy or what contributes to health or doesn't contribute to health, but rather just what is absolutely essential in the diet. And I would just say, just because we, just because carbs aren't essential in the diet, doesn't mean that having some amount of carbs is not ideal or optimal or beneficial. And I think we would have to look to a lot of other lines of evidence and argument in terms of biochemistry, in terms of hormones, in terms of, you know, the effects on muscle mass and, you know, talking testosterone, talking about female hormones, talking about thyroid hormones. I, I think we would have to, the, the argument has to be a lot more complex and mm -hmm. it's nice when we can simplify it and just say, try to make it as simple as like carbs aren't essential. So you don't, you don't, you shouldn't eat them, but I think it's just a, it's about as weak of an argument as there is. And I think you could really say the same thing about fat, right? Fat isn't essential. So you don't need to eat it. Just get your 0.1% of omega sixes and omega threes. And I don't agree with that either. Uh, I think fats also serve a ton of important purposes and we shouldn't avoid them just because monounsaturated, mono, monounsaturated and saturated fats are not essential. That's a very weak argument from my view. Yeah. Um, and regarding thyroid, um, I was doing a little bit of research, you know, Dr. Stephen Finney, who's a, a big, uh, you know, low carb proponent. And, uh, he was just, he, he I, I read this, uh, line that he wrote, he said, a ketogenic diet seems to result in improved thyroid hormone sensitivity, meaning it takes less hormone to produce the same effect. Um, which if anything puts less of a burden on thyroid hormone, T4 production in the thyroid gland and its conversion to three T3 in the liver. And so I'm, I'm curious to know your thoughts on that, because I, I think that's a knock sometimes with the ketogenic diet is over the long haul, perhaps it takes a toll on thyroid health. And, but when you, and, and then you hear a different perspective where someone, you know, makes the, a comment like that saying that, yes, maybe thyroid gets, you know, downregulated a bit, but he's just saying it, 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 it it's almost like more efficient or it's more sensitive in a sense. Yeah. So, and this was something I know we didn't get to today, but I did want to mention is I think there are some good papers looking at lower, like decreased T3, especially on ketogenic diets. There's, there's a good handful looking at, you know, three, four weeks in, um, but even some long-term ones on epile ep um, and epileptic patients, patients who have epilepsy, there's one titled changes of thyroid hormonal status in patients receiving ketogenic diet due to intractable epilepsy. It's a paper from 2017 and they uh, see decreased T3 levels. Uh, this was on, it was on 120 patients who were on the ketogenic diet for at least a year. So we're not looking at like short-term mechanisms here, um, showing increased incidence of hypothyroidism and, and decreased T3. And I, they weren't suggesting anything as far as improved sensitivity to it. I don't know what that would look like and uh, I'd be interested in seeing some of those papers, but I do think that that's, uh, something that's potentially, a uh, harmful outcome. And I know we talked about this last time too. This is something that Dom was talking about was that uh, women, and again, I'm just repeating what, what you had done, but I'd written it down that you said that, that women on the ketogenic diet for epilepsy are five times more likely to be amenorrheic. I think that that is also saying something as to some of those hormonal effects. Uh, and I would be concerned about, you know, for men, we, we might not be as sensitive or we might not see those changes as much, but I would be concerned about uh, androgenic hormones for men as well, due to some of those parallel mechanisms. Yeah. I'd like to add that, you know, most people are not, um, 
I mean, that's a clinical ketogenic diet, a four yeah, to one ratio. Yeah. It's really nothing like, I mean, kind of what most people are calling ketogenic diet. And I think if you equate for protein and get protein sufficient enough, uh, the thyroid issue is not that much of an issue. I will say that looking at blood work from the 1990s, where my T3 was a little bit always on the high end of normal, a couple of times it was like above normal, T THS and T4 were normal. And then ever since I've been on the ketogenic diet, it almost brought it from high normal to slightly above normal into normal range. So maybe I was just starting at a higher baseline of T3, but I've done lots of thyroid testing and I've, I've never been below normal or even on the low end of normal, usually just like right smack in the middle. But uh, uh, even when I fasted, yeah, actually my, my thyroid was kind of, I was expecting it to go down a little bit, but uh, but I, but I, I do think that uh, certain physiology, especially female physiology is much more reactionary to low glucose and low insulin. And insulin does play a role in uh, the enzyme that converts T4 to T3, the diiodinase enzyme. So that is regulated in part by just your energetic status, but but just by insulin too. So it's, something, it's just something to monitor. I, I think it's important to monitor. And, uh, and like I said, I don't think necessarily a ketogenic diet is like a default diet for lifestyle or longevity, but I do trend towards low carbish. So the idea is that titrate the amount of carbohydrates in based on, on your lifestyle, based on your performance, based on uh, a number of metabolic biomarkers, but probably most importantly, titrate the amount of carbohydrates in based upon your body composition and subjectively how you feel. And I think that's the important and, and only consider very low carb diets or ketogenic diets or fasting to manage some kind of chronic disorder that you have or, or as a metabolic therapy. Um, but, and I think it'll work better if, if you are following a sort of a quote unquote, normal, healthy, balanced diet and a problem does arise, then you could, a tool in your tool belt could be to transition to ketosis or, you know, use intermittent fasting or whatever as a tool to, to manage that. And, some people have periodic in inflammatory states. It could be like shingles. It could be like COVID. It could be autoimmune where it may not work as well uh, if you're chronically in this, you know, ketogenic state. It may work better if you just stay low carb, metabolically flexible, but use that tool to manage uh, it when it arises. And, and it's kind of like my general thoughts. <laughs> Yeah. And I'll just say on that point, Dom, I, you've talked a lot today about how you do a lot of sort of self-experimentation and you're, you're measuring like you're even though omega three, omega six tests that you're taking. I mean, I think a lot of people don't go to those links to measure these, you know, hair mineral tests. And, and I think if there's one thing people should take is that they maybe should start taking these measurements and finding out where they're at where the baseline is and sort of do a self-experimentation because I know Jay, you you were just on Brad's, uh, Brad Kern's podcast again. And, and, um, I've also started implementing carbs, uh, whole, you know, fruit mainly as a third meal, um, just to see how it would affect. Cause I got blood work done. This was probably like four months ago. And I, and I, and I actually waiting on blood work right now. So I'm going to see how it affect hormonal health and things like that. But I did do a DEXA scan. Um, it's interesting cause I was texting with Brad about, um, what, it, you know, from so eight, so August, um, I did a DEXA scan until now. And between then and now my lifting and everything was the same. You know, I lift like four days a week, you know, um, and I implemented about 600 more calories and about, uh, probably at least 150 grams more of carbs. I would say at least, um, and I was like, I could tell a difference in my body. And I, I went up 2% body fat. I went from 9.6 to 11.8. I gained about 10 pounds. I put on five pounds of fat and five pounds of lean muscle. Um, and I have no visceral fat from that, which was a good positive. I think it was a somewhat of a positive outcome um, from all of that. I was So I put on about five pounds of muscle and five pounds of fat from that. Um, and, uh, 
no visceral. So I just thought it was interesting. And I know Brad did it and Brad didn't put on any weight. I know Brad implemented and, you know, but also Brad's training was different than my training. Right. So I think it depends on your goals and where you want to be. Like, I know he's a sprinter. I don't really sprint or he, you know, he, he high jumps and does things. I was simply just resistance training. Um, and so I'm waiting on the blood work. And so we'll see what that comes back. See how, you know, maybe thyroid is and things like that. If that took an effect or maybe, you know, improved. Um, so I guess my point is who knows, Brad did one thing. I did another thing. We got different results. So I think the, the, the moral of the story is you got to sort of do some type of self-experimentation and do some testing. And if you want to implement a certain dietary, um, you know, dietary, uh, protocol, then, then you can sort of see, see what it does. So. And sustainability is a big thing too. You know, you don't want to push yourself into following a particular dietary paradigm uh, if you're not enjoying it and if it's not sustainable. I mean, a big reason that I shifted towards, you know, ketogenic and, and even intermittent fasting is that I could get more work done in the lab and, and, you know, not have to stop to prepare a meal, eat a meal, clean up, things like that. So logistically, it, it made a lot of sense, you know, in, in academia where you're just, true. just going full 100% all the time. Uh, but now I've transitioned back towards like three to three meals a day, sometimes even four with a snack. Uh, and, uh, yeah, but, I, but I, I did actually back in the day, I was eating six meals a day and I, don't know, I would even wake up in the middle of the night and drink a protein shake. Oh, wow. Like I had that crazy. That is hardcore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just back, you know, back in yeah. the day. And, and I was actually in, in grad school at the time so, or, or undergrad, but all I did is basically study and lift and eat that's all i did i don't i didn't had had much less obligations way back then but right. I, I could good, never go a, back to that pattern that's so people point. need to embrace and adopt the pattern that they're going to stick with and that's not screwing up you know and they want to just at the very least on a yearly level to do a comprehensive blood work analysis body composition I'm telling you, because as you get older, you start thinking about how age is affecting you. And I go back and look at this and it motivates me to be like, OK, I got to stop losing like lean body mass. I got to maintain my strength, you know, because I know maintaining muscle and maintaining certain metabolic biomarkers are going to pay big dividends uh, over the next 10 to 20 years for me. And I think right now is when, you know, you got to put in the time and effort and work to improve those things. So I'm telling that to like the younger crowd out there to start <laughs> measuring and start, you know, tracking and, and monitoring your blood work and keeping records of all this stuff. Cause uh, I didn't really think about it like five years ago, but something about, you know, just getting older <laughs> makes me think about, I, I need to track these things. So I understand where my body's going. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. And, and I would just add in as far as doing the tracking in terms of the numerical values, you know, the blood tests and everything also consider how you're feeling, you know, if yeah. whether somebody's on either side of the spectrum, uh, as far as carbon intake or food intake, whatever it is, uh, yeah, evaluate how you're feeling and be open to trying new things and, and seeing how that goes. And I would preface also for somebody who's been low carb or fasting for a while, there's a couple things I would consider when, if someone's trying to transition to bring more carbs in. So Brian, this might, you know, maybe could pertain more to you, but we a talked about how, when you haven't been burning a lot of carbohydrates, the machinery that normally burns those carbohydrates is downregulated. And so there can be an interim period where you're not going to be particularly uh, insulin sensitive. And, and that's something to consider. Uh, there's also can be some changes in the blood tests as well, as far as thyroid activity that can actually make someone think it's worse. So one thing that can happen is if somebody was under a lot of stress, that TSH level will get suppressed. So cortisol will uh, suppress that TSH. And something that I do see a lot in the people who are coming to me and have struggled on low carb is I'll see the elevated reverse T3 along with a low TSH. And to me, that's suggesting a actually suppressed thyroid activity. Sometimes there'll be excess cortisol at the same time. So we see the suppressed TSH due to cortisol and impaired T4 to T3 conversion, largely also due to the cortisol and related mechanisms. And so if you then bring carbs in and see your TSH jumps up, let's say it goes from one to four, that I would just caution that that doesn't necessarily mean a decrease in thyroid activity. It can mean a relief from suppression. So that's just, you know, it's important to interpret these things and also recognize that in that transitionary period, some things uh, might look off in mm -hmm. initially. Um, so that's one thing I would consider. The other thing too is with the 
change in, in insulin sensitivity. And also you mentioned, Brian, you know, bumping up the calories by 600 calories a day or something like that, which when I did this, I bumped up by a lot more than that um, because I had been also coming from a place of under eating and restriction and had a lot of benefit to bringing those, to bring my uh, calories up significantly. But I also gained a decent amount of weight, but that did then come back down. You know, it was, that was a part of, for me, my, uh, like something that was very, uh, healing and rejuvenating for me and, re- you know, led to me feeling a lot better, uh, was eating a lot more, including a ton of carbohydrates. And I did gain some weight, but then it came, uh, came back down without intentionally restricting or anything like that, uh, to a point where I was, I was, uh, very lean still. And I don't necessarily suggest that if somebody is coming from low carb to then go in and increase your calories a ton or increase your carbs a ton, I think you are more likely to see some effects like weight gain. If you do that, for some people that's worth it and, and they're okay with that as long as it's a moderate amount and they're careful. For other people, maybe it's better to take a more measured approach. So just wanted to throw that caveat out there as well when it comes to the experimentation side. Yeah, right. Like you could have that sort of mid period where you might get these results that you might not really want per se, but it's just in a, your body adjusting, which could have essentially for, for my case happened a little bit here. I bet that, you know, in, in another, if I keep eating the way I'm eating in another four months, it might just level out a little bit. Um, and that could have been part of the reason why, you know, but I, I was overall happy. I mean, like you, Dom, like you mentioned, as you get older, you got to maintain lean tissue muscle mass. Right. And so if you could put on five pounds of muscle mass, um, you know, without, you know, putting on much visceral fat at all, that's, that's a good step in the right direction. Yeah. And it might not be jumping to like three, 400 grams of carbs a day. It just titrated in from 75, a hundred or whatever to like 150 right. or 200. I'm of the opinion, you know, keeping the fiber content high and then letting, uh, like a continuous glucose monitor or your postprandial glucose level, not getting above like 140 or something like that and, and let that guide you. Uh, and, and, you know, even if you spike up, it's not all that bad. It's, unless it stays elevated for a long period of time. But if it comes back down, that's normal. But, you know, keep in mind that if you add carbs back in, and I remember eating fish and rice, just being hungry, like eating and like two or three, I'd get hungry and then I eat again. That was normal. I mean, it's kind of part of your body growing. But, you know, part of the logistical behavioral advantage of eating low carb is that I pretty much never get hungry. I mean, today's the rare day that I'm like fasting, right? And I'm like, I have absolutely no appetite lots of energy, feel great. And, uh, and it's only because I have fasted previously or done low carb. Do I feel great now? You know what I mean? If I went from just high carb to fasting, then my body would have like a, a stress response. So, you know, adapt your body to it, but I think it's, it's beneficial to stay metabolically flexible, you know, to not, completely eliminate this macro or that macro, but just to have balance, of course, unless you're using a ketogenic therapy to manage something. And I, I kind of harp on that because that's what we study and, and we do know it has very real world effects. And I think maybe the next frontier is this metabolic psychiatry uh, field that is expanding quite rapidly now uh, and looking at anxiety, looking at bipolar, looking at depression, things like that. So I, I do think there's, a lot of science that needs to be done and a lot of people suffer from a lot of these these uh psychiatric conditions so i think there may be uh ketogenic therapies may be a tool in the toolbox for that too yeah for sure um well this was great guys it went really fast <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> you know maybe down the road we'll do a part for you what the hell right <laughs> um i'm up for it yeah, yeah, whenever. Be fun. yeah of course of course um and uh Where's the best place? I know, Dom, I know you have some stuff coming up. Uh, where's the best place for people to find if they want to uh, learn more about your research? Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, ketonutrition.org, ketonutrition.org. Uh, we have a newsletter. Sign up for that. We have a blog. Uh, we cover many, many different topics that we discussed. And also ask people to check out Metabolic Health Summit, which is a conference that I help co-host. And, uh, and we're developing a virtual platform for that. So maybe check out the website. There's a YouTube page with many speakers that you guys would be familiar with. Uh, Rhonda Patrick was our uh, keynote speaker for the last one. She gave a great talk on intestinal permeability, 
you know, lipopolysaccharide, all the different things you guys touch on. Uh, and I think that's free on YouTube now. You can watch that. So yeah, Metabolic Health Summit and ketonutrition.org. Okay. And, and Jay? Uh, yeah, so I always like to point people, I have a uh, some free content, you know, if, if someone's looking to maybe take some practicals uh, away from, you know, the mechanisms and everything that we're, you know, everything that we're digging into today, I have a free mini course and uh, digs into some of the basics as far as, you know, as far as what I would be doing in terms of diet and lifestyle and stress and, and all of that to uh, maximize our, our health from that bioenergetic lens. And so people can find that at jfeldmanwellness.com slash energy. And uh, other than that, I have a podcast called the Energy Balance Podcast and articles and, and also links to the podcast and things like that uh, at my website, which is jfeldmanwellness.com. Excellent. Well, guys, this was great. Thanks for coming on for part two. And I appreciate you you being on the show. Thanks for having Thanks me, me, Brian. Brian. Yeah. It was good talking with you, Dom. Yep, you too, Jay. Till we meet again. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for listening to the get lean e clean podcast i understand there are millions of other podcasts out there and you've chosen to listen to mine and i appreciate that check out the show notes at briangrin.com for everything that was mentioned in this episode feel free to subscribe to the podcast and share it with a friend or family member that's looking to get their body back to what it once was thanks again and have a great day